All right, I think we could go ahead and get started. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Bella Clementi, MAG's Advancement Events Manager. Thank you all for joining us tonight for this special member webinar on Renaissance Impressions at the Memorial Art Gallery. Our guest today is Nancy Norwood, MAG's Curator of European Art. Nancy has been MAG's Curator of European Art at the Memorial Art Gallery since June 2000. She holds a bachelor's in Russian and a master's in art history from the University of Texas at Austin. She continued her doctoral work with a specialization in late medieval sculpture at the University of California, Berkeley. She came to MAG from the Detroit Institute of Arts where she was a Mellon Curatorial Fellow in the Department of European Sculpture and Decorative Arts for two and a half years. Nancy has originated over 20 exhibitions on a wide range of topics, including the late works of Claude Monet, Northern Renaissance prints, Indian miniature painting, Japanese prints, and German expressionism. She does it all. Uh, she also frequently serves as a project director for conservation and collections initiatives, including those funded by IMLS, NEA, and NISCA. Nancy, I will now pass the mic to you. Thank you, Bella. Um, welcome, everyone. And I am sorry that, you know, the more that I'm in this exhibition, um, the more I wish that you could be in this exhibition with me, because it's pretty phenomenal. And talking about the prints on a screen is just not the same thing. But um, we're going to do our best. So um, I don't know how many of you have seen uh, presentations on this exhibition from me before or from actually um, other people. Uh, Bernard Berthe, who was the organizing curator um, of the Kirk Edward Long collection, uh, gave the, the lecture on opening day, and that I know has been recorded and is available on our YouTube channel. It's definitely worth watching. He's very, very good, and he really knows the collection because he worked with Mr. Long personally to form it. Um, but what I've done on this is I'm just going to give a brief overview of the exhibition and the way the exhibition is organized in the hope that you will come and visit us and see the exhibition in person. Um, it closes February 6th, so there is time. And it's really, I think, well worth it um, to be in the space with these prints. They're just pretty extraordinary works of art. And they're also very interesting. Um, but then I'm just going to, you know, it's a little self-indulgent, but I'm going to just talk about some of the prints that I really, um, I find the most compelling. And, you know, I, I've given talks before the prints arrived and uh, they were compelling on in, in 2D or in a photograph, but they're incredible in person. And so I've chosen a few of those just to talk about that um, show the variety and the depth of the collection that is here. Um, the first thing I wanted to do is, is, this is one thing we do at MAG is um, when we decide to take an exhibition, we come up with something called a golden nugget, which is like three or four sentences that the entire institution uses. So they all, everybody knows exactly what this exhibition, the sort of broad parameter, the broad brush of, this ex of the exhibition is. And our golden nugget for this was um, that it explores the emergence and the transformative impact of the print medium on the visual culture of Renaissance Europe, um, showcasing the extraordinary technique, imagery, and Im imagination of these master printmakers of the time. And one thing that we did um, here at MAG, so the print collection was actually, the prints themselves from um, the long collection were, or it was organized by the American Federation of the Arts. Um, and AFA is one of the preeminent um, exhibition organizers in the country, but they were incredibly generous with us to um, and allowed us to expand the exhibition to include um, works of art, decorative arts, um, such as stained glass and armor, textiles, um, ceramics, enamel, that sort of all had from the 16th century as well, that all have uh, prints sources for their imagery that is used. And it's not just a matter of copying prints by these other artists, but so how this, this medium really did transform not just the graphic medium, but also other works of art and other media all across Europe um, in the 16th century. The image on the right is um, by the Netherlandish artist um, or the Dutch artist, Hendrik Bolsius, and he was one of the, the really great 
and here's an, this is an image of Apollo in the clouds and, um, you know, surrounded by this incredible halo. There's a lyre at his feet. He's the god of music. And then in the back, you have him riding his chariot. And so the way that um, line is used in these prints is really extraordinary. And we'll talk about technique in a minute. But the, the basic um, sort of parameters is that the printmaking was really for Europe, not for the East, but um, for Europe, it was a really very new medium. It's not that the actual technique was new, it's that um, paper was available widely. So a lot of the techniques had originated, for example, in metalwork, um, and those were then with this wide available of paper, which again um, came later in Europe uh, from the from the East, um, really didn't begin until around 1390. And so then heading into the 15th and then particularly the 16th century, um, you get this whole development and it's very, very rapid. It's, it's, it's sort of like the internet. We were, um, we were talking earlier today with, um, with one of the sponsors of the show and that really, she kept saying, you know, this is so contemporary. It's like this all happens so quickly and that's right on the market really did. Um, and there were sort of two types of prints that emerged. Um, there were sort of these unique designs that printmakers made. Um, and then they were commissioned sometimes by publishers, sometimes by painters to reproduce major works of art. And we'll look at, at some of those as well. So it was a way of expanding people's knowledge of say, say there's a famous altarpiece in a church in Italy and the painter of that altarpiece either works with a printmaker to reproduce it essentially. And so then that print travels. And so you don't have to go to that church to see that altarpiece. You see that altarpiece and then that those techniques, those motifs are taken and they travel like wildfire through France or Italy or wherever. So it, it's, a, it's a way of the tr transmission of images that you don't really see um, happening before this. And it really all has to do with the print medium. Um, you also have a new art market develop um, of people are starting to collect prints as works of art. Um, you have a brand new field of commerce um, with print publishers. There were no pu print publishers before the 16th century. And so it's a, it's a new profession basically. And so you have those publishers are committing, are, co um, are commissioning printmakers and we'll look at some of those too. And then there's the, the idea of availability and affordability. Uh, I don't think prints were, I mean, they weren't available to poor people, but they were certainly available to many, many more people than, um, than a, a, an, a single painting or a single portrait of, of someone. And it was also a matter of ownership. You know, people, people, people began to acquire um, so the, there's three techniques that were used basically in um, printmaking in the 16th century. Um, and they, we'll get to those in a second. But so what we did was we, um, we designed this map. It, it, the show didn't come with a map. And um, I really thought it was important to talk about where things are from and how different uh, the 16th century looked in Europe than it does today, for example. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that that the the country of Italy didn't exist until the 19th century. It was this series of, you know, you have Venice was a republic, Naples was a kingdom, the Papal States, you know, the Vatican, they ran this whole area. Then you have Florence, you have um, Sicily. There's just, it's, it's a lot of different, um, individuals and rulers and then of course um the vatican who are all commissioning works of art for different purposes and then you have um relating to sort of a broad brush of germany of present-day germany you have the holy, holy roman empire which was much larger than present-day germany but um and that's really you know and all of these areas are having religious conflicts. You have the Protestant Reformation going on in Germany or in the Holy Roman Empire where the North 
um, the North becomes Protestant, you know, in the early 16th century, and the South sort of remains Catholic in their, their actual wars and destruction of works of art. A similar thing is happening. So you have the Low Countries, and the Holy Roman Empire was not really a Roman emperor. It was sort of in name only, but it was a lot of different uh, nobles, and the city states were very important. You have um, there's a lot of civic development. So the you have these um, you know town halls and things that were being built, and so there's more secular work than than religious work um, and commissions based in secular. And then, you know what what comprises a good ruler. Uh, and then in the area of here of the Low Countries, this corresponds to the present day Netherlands and Belgium and Flanders, Luxembourg. Um, and this area was a, also, it was very commercial. Um, it's one of the great centers of printmaking in the 16th century. Antwerp was a, a sort of a hot spot for publishers of prints. And then the, then France was, um, you also have a lot of religious wars and this push pull between France and the Holy Roman Empire with the Low Countries, um, and then also the the artists and particularly the artisans in the Low Countries were um, great exporters of works of art, especially um, decorative arts and furniture, things like that. And then you have the Kingdom of France, which is very much a kingdom, and King um, Francis I was the first in a, in a long line of, um, of kings who actually brought artists from present day Italy, uh, like Rosso and from Ticcio to decorate uh, his palaces like at Fontainebleau, the chateau, the various imperial chateau. Um, and so sort of bringing the 16th century mannerist style, which is, is um, really an art historical construct and I've tried not to, I mean, these are all mannerist prints um, that are really characterized uh, by, um, and, you know, we'll see these as we go through, but by these extreme gestures and like very, very packed narratives and um, you know, exaggerated facial features and things like that. Um, so it's, it's, they're all kind of over the top in that way. And so when King, when Francis I brought these um, artists from outside, I guess he felt like he didn't have enough great French artists to use. Um, that brought this entire style to France as well. So you have these artists and they're working across borders and you have artists, you have artists from Germany who are really interested in classical art and sculpture and architecture and antiquity who are tr either traveling to Italy or they're looking at prints that were made by people in this part of Europe. And so the motifs are traveling, but also the stories, then you have a lot, you know, huge development in secular literature. You also have, um, with the publishing industry, you have not just art prints, but you have anatomical treaties being published like crazy in the 16th century. And so um, there's a lot of nudity in these prints. And I think a lot of it, if you really look at the, the body forms, I mean, it's, they're definitely related to these anatomical works because, you know, before people weren't, artists weren't really drawing so much from nature. This is also a time when artists were able to go to morgues and, um, you know, study bodies, dead bodies in, in, uh, in reality, not just sort of making them up. Um, in terms of the exhibition, the way it's set out, and this is, you know, just to how we decided to do it. So there's 82 prints from the long collection that are in the show and it just seemed a little overwhelming to just kind of line them up on the wall we would have lost people i think so just as a strategy to keep people engaged and give people sort of bite-sized pieces the way it works is in this section here this is the introduction to the exhibition this is coming in from where the kasama venus um statue is in, in the hawks gallery and this, this is a selection of prints from the long collection that I think represent the themes and the motifs and the areas that are being discussed and some of the some of the highlights and some of the things that are going on in 16th century and also just talks a little bit about um, Mr. Long and I, I, he's kind of a mysterious 
guy. I don't know much about him except that uh, the collection is in California and um, Mr. Long lives in Bangkok. Uh, he initially started um, collecting symbolist and surrealist works. And then when he realized that those artists were actually looking back to the 16th century at works by these mannerist um, printmakers and painters, he decided that's what he wanted to collect. So he sold his other collections and then he started um, acquiring these. And he now owns, I think, Bernard, um, the, present, the organizing cure, um, I think he owns over 1,200 prints, and there are 82 in this exhibition. So it's quite um, quite narrowed down in terms of what he has. So we really we sort of have the best of the best, I think, um, in this show. Then we have uh, we have a lot of activities. There's we have uh, magnifying glasses for people to get really close looks at the prints. We have these art spots, scavenger hunts that are quite fun. Um, and then we have the sort of geography section. So there's a map and a text here. And then these are examples from each different region. And again, these are sort of bite-sized pieces. Um, this is the technique section. Um, our, Niall Blenner, director of academic programs, worked with a University of Rochester professor um, to make this six minute video that it's, uh, it's silent, but it explain, it just shows so beautifully the process of making uh, woodcuts, engravings, and etchings to where, you know, you can write all you want about how to, and I'm going to, you know, say some of that in this, this talk, but really to watch someone creating, uh, and she she was so great, she was so great, she used motifs from the prints in the exhibition, and so she really did it specifically for this show. Um, and then we have this section. So these are techniques and so people can really get a sense of the, the quality of the work and how line all of these, I mean, it's hard to remember that when you have these narrative images, so many of them, I mean, it's, it's just line really. And the fact that these artists could do this with line and ink is, is, is pretty incredible. Then we have just a little basic introduction to themes in this section here. And then it sort of the show sort of goes on and is loosely um, loosely organized by region. So um, you know the the southern work, the French work, the Low Country work, and the German work. And then interspersed within that are the decorative arts that I mentioned. And the decorative arts are all from Mag's permanent collection. Um, so we're going to do just a little bit on the technique because that's so important. And then um, we'll look at individual prints. So a woodcut is really, it's pretty much the earliest form of print. Um, and so it's where the printmaker carves an image and relief into a block of wood. And then when ink is applied to the block, the raised areas are gonna hold the most ink. And this image is then transferred onto paper. Um, and it has the, the most, you know, it's, a, it's an actual carving implement. The lines tend to be uh, a little bit thicker and a little bit wavier. They're not quite as straight as some of the other techniques, but it's a it's a really wonderful um, technique. And Albrecht Durer, um, who did this print of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, uh, was really a master at this technique. And you can see um, this is from the Book of Revelation. So you have uh, you have an archer shooting a bow and arrow that. Um, is supposedly kind of embedded with, with germs, so spreading pestilence, uh, timely for our time. And you have war, which is indicated by this horseman with a sword. Um, then you have, and it was interesting, uh, a lot of people think that if you can see these scales, that this is justice, but actually the scales are empty. And so it, it represents famine um, because the scales were used to weigh grain. And then you have this, this writer here. So this is the apocalypse, right? This is the end of the world. Um, and this is the death um, on horseback and obviously emaciated with, with um, his pitchfork. He's funneling people, including a king, first off, into this hell mouth in the corner. So. Um, it's very much a doom and gloom thing, but it's, it's really one of the great prints. Um, and then you have 
a chiaroscuro wood cut, which is really the first form of color printing. So a printmaker would use two or more blocks to, to print a, a complete image. Usually one block uh, was the line block where, so for example, um, in here where you get these, these linear things, and then the others would, um, would create the hues, the different tones. And uh, there are about, I think there are five or six in the show. They're very rare and they're very beautiful and really, really difficult to make. It's pretty impressive. The next uh, technique that actually was I uh, probably the most frequent um, in this period was engraving and that um, originated in metalwork. So you have a design that's incised onto a, a metal plate and in the Renaissance it was usually copper. In fact, it was I think, pretty much always copper. Um, with And it was incised with a cutting tool called a burin. Um, and so then that burin will create a sort of a V-shaped groove in the metal and then tone and shading can be suggested. And it's all through line. So if you look at, for example, this print by Goldsmiths, um, you have a real variety of lines. Sometimes they're straight, sometimes they're hatched, but in order to create these tonal um, forms and then the, the, uh, the sense of depth in terms of moving, like in here, you know, moving back into this distance and, you know, the, the darker the ink in the foreground and the lighter in the background, really creating this incredible sense of depth. And then finally, um, Etching was developed, which also uh, originated. Um, the technique was in existence, but then it started being applied uh, to printmaking. And that's a similar um, process to engraving, except that the composition is drawn with a needle onto um, either a wax or resin coated metal plate that's then soaked in acid. And that corrodes the exposed line of the design and leaves the coating intact. And then it was, it was rolled through a press, paper was applied to it and then rolled through a press. And um, etching techniques were originally used for decorating armor and other metal objects were similar to engraving. And one thing that is interesting, um, Parmigianino was a very well-known painter and a lot of painters didn't make their own prints, but Parmigianino became very interested in, in etching. And it's interesting when you look at the painters of this period, who um, who did make prints of their own work, uh, they often used etching. And I think you can see why. I mean, there's this very painterly sort of feel to it. It's a much sort of softer thing than in just a straight incised line. And then um, the subject matter. So there's, there's it's kind of, it's all over the place really, but um, one thing that was very important, um, and you see a lot, whether whatever the subject uh, in these prints is allegory, which um, these allegorical images, which is our, our stories or images in which characters and events represent particular qualities that relate to morals or religion or politics. And sometimes those are apply, those um, work in images um, from the Christian faith from the Old and New Testament and um, also the classical world. So allegory can kind of cross all of the boundaries. Uh, and then there's sort of a fourth uh, category, which are sort of, they're very enigmatic images and we, I like those the best, so we'll look at those tonight. Um, but that's, that's, that's the basic breakdown. Um, so the, now we get to talk about specific prints that I love. Um, so this is Wisdom a Conquering Ignorance. Uh, this is sort of the poster child for the show. And it shows um, this image of Minerva. It's after a painting. Um, so it was a reproductive print. It's hard to know if it was commissioned by a publisher or for the painter worked directly with the artist. But um, so this shows the figure of Minerva as Wisdom. And she's surrounded by, she's got her foot here. I've got a detail that we'll go to. Um, so this is a figure of ignorance and identified by these donkey ears here. Um, and then surrounded by the liberal arts and muses and gods. So here you have, for example, um, 
And this is an, a personification, but this is I can you know this is um, the attribute of architecture. You have these architectural influence. Uh, this is painting here, and I love how painting is basically drawing on sculpture. Who's holding this statue of um, the goddess Ceres? You have over here the god of commerce, goddess of war. This is an astrolabe, so this is represents the figure of astronomy. So basically, um, all of these figures are supporting ignorance, um, in, supporting wisdom's um, defeat of ignorance, and that's reaffirmed by this figure here in the lower right of uh, the muse of history, who um, is writing her her pen breaks the frame, and she's writing in this lower margin the ignorant will not be honored. So it's pretty clear exactly what she's talking about. Um, this is another allegorical image, which is pretty extraordinary. It's um, by, so a lot of times you'll see in these images, there'll be like, um, there'll be an initial, like this is, so this artist whose name was not, is not known, it's called the monogramist M because of this uh, here in the lower right. And this figure of a woman looking in a mirror um, is a really classic late medieval Renaissance image of a memento mori, to think on death, a reminder that death comes for all of us. Um, the title of this print is, has to do with this title here written in the margin. But here you have this nude woman looking um, in the mirror and right around the corner, she's not noticing her because her head's turned away looking in the mirror and, and you know, um, is this figure of death with the skeleton and these sort of, it's pretty incredible that you can actually make a print of a skeleton leering and you know exactly that's what's going on. Um, and so here, death is holding this hourglass, which means the clock has started ticking um, to her death. Um, and it's always this reminder, memento mori. So then the wheel is the wheel of fortune, um, which, decides for everyone. And then this is a very unusual, this bird wing in the lower left is very unusual. Um, I've never seen that before, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, it's a reference to, again, to vanity and plumage. Um, you know, how, how birds with incredible wingspans will sort of, um, sort of press out their wings and in and, and, and great vanity. And obviously the wing has become detached from its bird. So it's uh, in a lot of ways, the fallen, you know, it's, it's the demise of the, the bird. It's another lesson in terms of vanity. Uh, there are a lot of images of death. This is another example of, you could consider it a memento mori. And, you know, one reason I, it's called the aviary of death. And one reason I really love this print is, um, there's a larger detail or a larger image of it, is that it's so, it fools you, I think, or it fools me. Um, you have this, like, here's this scholar and two students and they're sort of engrossed in their book. And then here you have, it's all very soft. You have these, um, these musicians playing here in this pastoral setting, all very ideal. You have these courtiers here up in the, um, in this little tower area. But when you really look at what's going on, you have death, you have these skeletons, that's a pretty surefire way of indicating death. Um, and they're actually, if you look at what they're doing, they're emerging from this tower, so sort of secretly. But this here, um, there, it's, an owl, it's a 16th century method of uh, hunting owls. So it's a lure. And so really you have death hunting souls. And then if you look a little deeper, there's another figure of death back here. Um, this is not death, but this is a dead person. This is a cadaver. So we sort of know what is coming. And then it's pretty extraordinary back here. You know, it's all so light and kind of, I don't want to say happy because it's not, but it's not sort of this dark ominous thing, but you do have death chasing these poor people here into a net, trapping them. And if you have any doubt as to what's gonna happen, if you look at this image here, these are people already trapped in a net and, and sort of captured not to be released. 
And then um, finally, sort of sailing into this uh, sea of you know, tempestuous waves, you have the, it's just basically a, a ship of death and ship of doom. Um, there's a skull and crossbones here on the, on the sail, just in case you really didn't know. So I think the thing I really love about it is just that it is this, at first glance, it seems like this sort of pastoral scene. And then it's only when you start looking at it that you realize how ominous it is and how actually terrifying it is. Um, and it definitely works as a reminder of remember your death. This is another of my favorites um, called The Witch's Profession. It's very, very strange print, but it's, um, it's pretty incredible. And I think when you come in to see the show, uh, you'll see it. So there's this, what's going on is you have this very, very strange uh, skeleton here. I mean, I, it almost looks like a dinosaur, but I know it's, you know, I mean, did they know about dinosaurs? I don't know. But um, it's just, it's, it's a completely fantastical thing with uh, some, there's these little babies trapped in here. Then you have a witch seated here. You know, she's a witch, she's nude. Um, her hair is flowing back here. There's, she's holding this steaming cauldron and the steam is mixed in with her hair. You're here. And then, um, the goat in this period uh, usually referred to Satan or evil. And so you have a sort of regular goat and you have a figure riding a goat. Um, it's fascinating how she has a baby trapped in her hand here, but also one of these beautiful young men who perhaps are fallen angels, it's hard to know. Um, he's holding a baby here trapped. So, you know, obviously the end result for these babies is not going to be positive. And then the thing that is extraordinary to me about this print is that you have these birds over here at the top left, um, and they're sort of discombobulated, sort of tossed about by the wind. And so it just as a, as a visual object, the thing that it makes, it makes it so special to me is you have sort of moving from left to right, you have all of these, um, these rushes, these reeds, her hair, the steam is all blowing in this, you know, really wild wind um, to the right. But at the same time, you have this force of these figures pushing and pulling going to the left. And so in between is caught just this and one of the real um, characterizations of mannerist, the mannerist style is this dynamic, you know, this dynamism of movement um, that just doesn't stop throughout the whole thing. And I mean, just the, the technical ability of the, this printmaker. Um, this actual subject is really still up for grabs. Um, you know, they, uh, Bernard Verite has called it sort of the most um, discussed prints of the 16th century because scholars are still trying to completely figure it out. But, it, you know, it obviously definitely has to do with witchcraft and perhaps the triumph of witchcraft um, or uh, it's hard to know, but I mean, it's it, just in terms of a work on a visual image, it's just extraordinary. Then you still get some of these macabre things, themes that are um, actually being applied, not just to these esoteric works, but to biblical works as well. So this um, print, and there's another one of the same subject, is from the visual, the vision of Ezekiel, where um, God, it's in the Old Testament, God speaks to Ezekiel and tells him to uh, reanimate the, um, it's in the, the valley of the dry bones, and uh, which is full of skeletons, and, and God speaks to Ezekiel and says for him to reanimate these skeletons. So um, he does. And um, so you see here these two, it's all set in sort of a classical architecture with these classical sculptures holding things up. So there was this real love um, in the 16th century um, for 
classical, you know, the classical world. I mean, there were people were really looking back, but at the same time, they're looking at these other stories. So they're they're actually setting these um, these narratives in classical frames, which is, is interesting. So here you have in the center, you have these two skeletons, and they're they're really quite jovial, very happy, I think, to be sort of reanimated. Um, and then once the skeletons are reanimated, according to um, the account, God speaks to Ezekiel again and says, now basically say again these words and, and put the ligaments and the skin back on them and really, you know, to return them to being human. So what we see um, over here to the right, and I, I think it's fascinating because I guess the skeletons look so comfortable being re put back together, but it must be incredibly painful to have sinew and muscles and things and skin sort of put back on your body to stretch. And you can really see, um, you can see in the faces of these figures, <clears throat> excuse me, in particular, just the agony that they're going through. So it's, it's a really, it's an extraordinary um, print. And another thing that's kind of amazing about it is that, you know, besides the fact that you have all these great skulls and things, um, you know, Ezekiel is not in this print, right? Um, Ezekiel is actually where we, the viewers are, looking in and seeing what's happening. Whereas the other print in the show that's right next to this print um, in the exhibition has Ezekiel sort of center stage in the print itself. So it's just, it, you know, I, we tried when we were installing to, um, you know, if there were scenes of the same, if there were um, prints of the same theme or the same subject matter, when it made sense to put them together so that people could see different ways of representing the same story. Um, because that sort of gives a, a glimpse in terms of creativity. Um, this is another example of setting. It's a biblical scene. This is the, um, the Massacre of the Innocents, uh, where King Herod, after he found out that um, the infant Jesus was born and would become, according to you know prophecy, would become king, um, Herod ordered all male children under the age of two to be slaughtered. Um, and so this is that scene, the massacre of the innocents. And uh, again, it's set in this classical courtyard, these classical columns. And it's just a really dreadful, dreadful scene. Um, it's very upsetting because you have these, it's, it's really over the top. And again, you know, this is one of these characteristics of mannerism where, um, so here's, you know, you have a woman here, a mother who's holding her child's head, which has been, you know, and, and other soldiers are ripping children away from their mothers. And I mean, it's just, it's just a horrifying scene, but it's fascinating that the printmaker chose to represent it um, like this, or not even the printmaker, but the printmaker who is making a print after, um, actually after two, the unknown artist is making it after a painter named Anton Arena and who is making it after the painter Bandinelli. Um, so, you know, this is again, another way that these, um, that these images were, um, you know, start with a single painting and then it would, it would spread through, um, through prints, print sources that were, that traveled basically. Uh, and then you have another print by Albrecht Durer, if you remember the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Um, this again is one of my favorite prints. It uh, has to do with, it's called The Harrowing of Hell or Crush in Limbo. And it has to do with what happens between um, Jesus's death and burial on the Friday. And then, well, what we, what the Christian tradition now celebrates as um, Good Friday and then Easter Sunday for the resurrection on that day. And this was a very, very important day in Eastern Orthodox more than in um, the Western church. But you have Jesus going into, literally going into hell and bringing out, because it was the ever present sort of um, theological question, well, what about people who did not have the chance to convert? I mean, people still ask this question in Christian, um, the Christian tradition. So here you have the figure of Jesus in hell you can tell it's hell. You have these guardians of hell, which are just extraordinary 
beef and um, Dura wrote a lot about the imagination that you could, uh, the imagination was pretty all powerful. Um, and here Jesus is stretching out his arm. This is John the Baptist who um, was killed before he obviously baptized Jesus, but he's, we know it's John the Baptist through um, his beard and then he's wearing, and I, I love that, that Dura was able to actually Traditionally, John the Baptist is shown wearing a hair shirt. And I love that he was able to get that um, just with a woodcut, with a carving tool. I mean, I remind myself of that all the time when I look at these prints, how, how they did this with a block of wood and a tool and ink. It's just extraordinary. So um, the other figures here, this is, this is the figure of Adam. Eve is right behind, and so you he, Adam's holding the cross, but all, Adam is also holding the, al the apple or the fruit of uh, his downfall. And then these little babies are uh, really going back to these babies. Um, they are the, the innocents who were killed. So, you know, this is the whole group are the people who lived before, um, you know, it was possible. And so they were raised from the dead, raised from hell and taken into heaven when Jesus was resurrected, according to the story. And you get, again, that like I showed you the monogramist uh, M. This is uh, Albrecht Durer, is how he signed all of his, he was always signing it um, with his monogram on a rock or a wall or something. And then he dates things in an interesting way too. So there's 1510 and um, with his monogram. This is a really extraordinary print by Hendrik Oltis, um, who was really, I think, who's probably the most creative um, and, and finest of the Netherlandish printmakers. And this is uh, from like a classical uh, story, the Demogorgon creating, uh, who creates order out of chaos. Um, and so this cave of eternity is marked by, you have these clocks, these timepieces here, and this is the, this is the Demogorgon. And this figure in this circle or bubble really is the figure of nature blowing out um, of her pipe animals and flowers and plants. Uh, into nature. And then here you have the Demogorgon is animating them with his breath, with his spirit. Um, and he's also doing it with his wand that he's holding here. At the same time, um, you have the symbol of infinity, which is the snake uh, eating its own tail in this circle. So you have this really wonderful balance between the figure of nature and the snake. Um, and the whole time the Demogorgon is making notes and, and sort of uh, documenting everything, documenting this, this creating order out of chaos that um, he's responsible for doing. And finally, uh, in terms of the prints, this is one that I've just become more enamored of every time I see it. Um, and it's called the Calumny of um, Apelles, which uh, goes back to um, Apelles was an ancient Greek, according to tradition, was an ancient Greek painter. Um, and who, according to the writings, made this painting to humiliate the king who had believed those who had slandered him. And then that theme was taken over by the artist Federico de Caro, um, who was also slandered by his employer. And he created this allegory to avenge himself after being um, fired by this, this noble. Um, as he, he was the principal painter in an important villa. And then that painting, was uh, engraved by Cornelius Cote. So you have this really interesting, um, you know, classical ancient tradition. And to me, this sort of sums things up a lot. Um, 
this whole allegorical scene, but based in classical thought, done by an Italian painter, um, by a Netherlandish artist, and all of the, I won't talk about the borders tonight, but um, all of the, the images in the borders sort of support the story. So when you look at what's happening here, um, so each figure in the print is the personification of a god or a vice or a virtue. So on the left here, this figure with his arms outstretched and this very strange face in the He's got the ears of a donkey. So if you remember back to the figure of Minerva conquering ignorance, um, this king is, or this, this ruler is being represented as ignorant. Um, and he's being turned against the painter by suspicion, which is right behind him. And then this figure of uh, calumny or slander, who's holding this torch. And then nearby, you have this figure of envy, who's really quite um, decrepit, <laughs> um, pointing again here. You know, it's all these accusers here on the left, um, and sort of accompanied by these four animals, which is a fox, a wolf, a toad, and a leopard. They represent cruelty, malice, avarice, and fraud. Um, and then in the center, you have this extraordinary figure of um, greed. It's representing greed. And then this crazy winged figure feature, this crazy winged figure in the foreground. So you see this wing spread and then these, um, these webbed feet. Um, it represents um, deceit, deceitfulness, but you see the head here, but which means, so I mean, just the level of imagination that you get on all of these is, is really extraordinary. And then, you know, going back, if you think about that um, earlier print, that other print of Minerva, um, Wisdom Conquering Ignorance, here you have another image of Minerva with her helmet and, um, and she is restraining this figure of rage who is shackled. Um, and then on the right, so you have this whole group of people accusing um, this painter um, who is shown over here. Um, and the, the painter is saved by Mercury who holds this identifying staff. And then the nude figure here of ignorance. So it's being led away. And it's to me, this just really sums up so much of what this show is about. Um, in terms of the use of personifications and allegory and but also you have um, sort of the rise of the artist you have the sort of rise of the artist's ego um, really summed up here where it's, it's almost a you know a, a revenge piece uh, and that was you know undertaken out of being feeling betrayed and feeling like um, you know their artistic merit wasn't you know, and this is coming not so long after, in terms of European art, you know, most, most artists uh, were really anonymous, you know, they weren't signing their work or anything like that. They were, and so you do have this um, kind of development of artists were also very well educated in the classical world. They traveled, they, um, they read, they moved in very learned circles. Uh, they had their portraits done, you know, it was a very, it was a real phenomenon that really changed, um, changed things. So I sort of wanted to, there were a couple more, um, like once you get into this idea of artistic creativity, um, grotesques like this, so these, these grotesques have um, at their center, they have these Roman gods. So um, here you have the figure of Diana and here you have the figure of Venus. And then you, but the thing about the grotesque, these are tiny, these are like two, three, three inches by two inches. Um, you have this ability, the artist has this ability to play and to create these extraordinary like half, half creatures, um, half design work. And then a lot of these designs were used in other arts. They were transferred into other arts. So. 
Um, and you know, then you have this, these figures, these two figures here who are sort of squatting on this design element who are passing gas and it's just, you know, and then you have the serpent coming up and, and then all of these little design techniques. And, you know, it's just a real way for artists to, I mean, I, sometimes I look at these and I think of medieval marginalia and manuscripts where um, that's really the place that artists could develop their imagination and really explore their imagination. Um, and then finally, in terms of the prints, I wanted to sort of come back to this idea of this sort of new phenomenon of um, this new profession of publishing. And this, this was probably one of the first series because it was the first time that something was produced in series and, and these publishers, you know, that was a good deal. Instead of selling one print, you, you sold four or five. Um, and so things like the four elements, which is what this is, um, or the five senses were being produced. And so you have um, sort of the classic personifications um, and they're, you know, they, people would have known what they were looking at. There's, um, you have, for example, with the figure of water, this is represented by Neptune. Um, and then you have um, Juno is representing air. She's seated on this cloud-like airy throne. And then she has her characteristic peacock as an attribute. And then um, her husband, um, Jupiter, who's the king of the gods, is represented in fire. And so he's in this um, blaze of light and he's on an eagle and brandishing this, this um, thunderbolt. And this was commissioned by um, Hieronymus Koch, who was a uh, publisher. And like I said, it was the, probably the first series that was published, especially of uh, the four elements. And it's, um, it was, you know, these became very popular. And then these images were used in lots of other works of art. Um, and then finally, the second sort of type, whether it was a publisher commission or a painting commission, um, there was the idea of the reproductive print, which I alluded to before. But um, so this is uh, Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, um, the Last Judgment fresco. And almost as soon, like within the year of it being completed um, at the Vatican in the Sistine Chapel, um, printmakers were commissioned to reproduce that. And so what you got, this is, and there were several publishers who did it, several printmakers who were commissioned. Um, and so this is the Raft of Sharon, which is just a tiny portion of the painting. So here you have the boat and the figures sort of, you know, being taken across the river and the hell. This is the scene, it's from the lower right. Um, so it's here. It's just the section here on the lower right. And the interesting thing about it is that after a few years, the, the next Pope um, really did not like the nudity, the level of nudity in um, the fresco. And so Michelangelo had to sort of fix it, had to cover it up. And the print, this print was done um, before that happened. So if you look, for example, here, this figure here, you know, he's in full nudity here. So scholars can really look at, use this print to look at, um, at what the original intent was by the painter, by Michelangelo. So it's handy that way, but people also collected these and, you know, pieced them together. I think I read that, um, the number of prints for the, for, for this people would collect and there were 16, um, prints that would form the whole of the, uh, the Last Judgment fresco. And so that, you know, it led into this whole um, idea of collecting. So those are sort of the basic, basic types of prints. Um, and then I just wanted to very quickly talk about uh, the decorative arts that we included in the exhibition. Um, this is the, they're all from Max permanent collection and uh, we have some lovely things. So that was really nice to be able to combine them and sort of reinterpret them in this way. 
So this is the um, partial armor made for the Dukes of Brunswick Wolfenbill. Um, and it all, you know, it's, it's in, during the Renaissance that it became usually in the earlier period, armor was pretty much just metal and really didn't contain a lot of decoration. Um, the 16th century with the new methods and things. Um, you, so you, yeah, and these, they would have pattern books on, in the armory workshops and the, the Dukes of um, Brunswick actually had their own armory, but you can see that this image of, um, this is Adam lying here and Eve being born from his rib, according to the story. Here's uh, God the Father pulling Eve out of his rib and that's from this print. And here you have it, it's in reverse, um, but it's, you know, using the same basic image. So, and, but it wasn't just like the same print source. These were all being adapted um, to fit. So you have this small 2D print that has to be kind of changed and made to adapt a different, uh, a different format, a different span, uh, a completely curved surface like this. So again, you, this is our um, Limoges Taza. We know the print source. Um, here you can see it's, it's a little muddy, but um, basically it's the story, again, it's the story of Adam and Eve, the big thing, um, where Eve offers Adam a bite of the, the serpent, tricks Eve into offering Adam a bite of the apple. Um, which God had forbidden them to do. So after they eat of this forbidden fruit, um, they realize that they're naked, they're confronted by God, and then uh, they have to leave the Garden of Eden because they've fallen. Okay, so that's sort of the original story of, of the fall in the book of Genesis. So here, um, again, it's the artist extrapolating from, from that. So here you have it again in reverse, but you have God the Father chasing um, Adam and Eve out of the garden. And it's interesting with when you take this three-dimensional covered object, there are three scenes from um, this, this Old Testament illustration, um, which has its French done about the same time as the enamel, um, which is also French. And, you know, the artist isn't just copying it, the artist is taking those motifs. There's no Adam and Eve, for example, on the stem of this object. These are really, a lot of these are taken from grotesques. Um, you know, they're just designs that are used um, to complete a whole. So again, it's not just copying, it's actually manipulating imagery like a lot of people do with the internet today. And that's, I think, um, or Photoshop. I mean, artists have always manipulated other artists' images and this is no different. Uh, and then finally, we have a display of um, our silver stain roundels that uh, have been slowly building in the collection. Um, and I think this is also interesting in that this piece of glass on the left is French. Uh, the print from which it's taken on the right is from Albrecht Durer, um, who obviously was one of the more prolific friends it's called Virgin and Child with the Monkey. Uh, it's interesting that about the time this piece of glass was made, Durer was actually traveling in France and it's known that he had this print with him, this virgin and child with the monkey. So even though I don't think there's any like hard proof that this glass painter would have known Durer, um, you know, it was all coincidental, it was all happening at the same time in different, um, different parts of Europe. So, so, but what you have that's interesting is so you look at this figure here of the virgin and child and it's just right on the mark, but the monkey's not there. So the monkey is missing here. For whatever reason, the stained glass artist, the painter, wanted to have these little putti figures. Um, and so he or she used this um, print, Dance of the Cupids, after, which was after a painting by Raphael, um, here instead. So you have this French glassmaker using a German print as part source and an Italian print as part source um, to create a new image in a different medium. 
And I think that's one of the more exciting things about being able, um, and again, AFA was very generous to let us uh, do this with the exhibition in terms of expand what we're really talking about. And I think it adds a depth that um, that we, we don't have with just looking at the prints because we can see how they really, uh, really were sourced. So I think that is what I have for this evening and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Nancy, that was wonderful. You know so much and I feel like I learned a lot um, just looking and learning with you. So thank you for such a great presentation. We do have a few questions in the Q&A. Okay. Um, so I'm just gonna get through a couple. We'll see how many we can get through. Um, oh, I went over, the sorry. Were a little over, but I mean, we're all still here because you're so wonderful and it was really interesting. Um, so one question from Steve about the printmaking process for etching and engravings. Why do you need to soak the paper before making the print? Um, I think it's to make the paper more permeable for the ink is my understanding, but I'm not a printmaker, but I know that otherwise the, um, the ink is sort of on the surface and, and smears, I think, more easily, my understanding. I wouldn't know either. I've never done, I've always admired etchers and engravers. It looks challenging. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's just, there's so many, um, I mean, that's when we need to have the person who made the video here <laughs> to answer the, you know, because I'm sure there's a much more intelligent way to answer that question than I just did, but I'm pretty sure that's why. So. Well, Nancy, you bring up a great point um, for our viewers. We do have a really beautiful video that was made by, um, I believe, a, an art, a studio art professor, visiting art professor from U of R about the three different um, printmaking processes. And I would recommend that you all take the time to go watch it in the gallery space when you are next able to oh, visit. It, it explains it so well. And she did a good <laughs> job. It's only six minutes. And she doesn't explain it. It's not, it's silent. It's just watching her hands either carve or incise or roll through the press or, I mean, it's just, it's beautifully made and just, and I'm really glad there's no voice in it. You know, it's, I mean, it's subtitled, but there's no, nobody's talking because we all talk too much. So. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Um, another question for you, Nancy, from Amy. Are there other themes and styles of prints beyond the scope that Mr. Long collected happening during this time period? Um, well, I actually wound up getting a copy of um, a catalog from, it was, a, believe it or not, a larger exhibition that um, Bernard Verite did for Mr. Long's collection that he did at Stanford. And uh, I think there were 1,200 prints in that. I mean, I think they were all, he has a very representative um, collection, but I think one thing that they did not include in this one um, was there was this real fascination with classical architecture per se, and not just, um, I mean, not just using it like I was showing as a backdrop, um, but actually making prints of architectural monuments in the classical world. And that I think is a genre that they didn't think perhaps was so exciting um, to include in an exhibition, but it's, it's actually really interesting. Um, so there's that. And then, I mean, I think you do have not so much mannerist. I mean, I, I think a lot of these prints, the, especially the prints of Christian themes, um, they might've been used in a devotional way, but they weren't, I think there are, prints that are, are really less valuable probably that are straight sort of mass produced devotional images. But I, I don't think that people probably collected those. I think they, they use them um, for devotional work. Um, one final question. So there seem to be many male artists and printmakers from this era. Were there any women artists that we know about or yeah, was sure. it a lot of thing? There's um, actually in the exhibition, um, there is one print. Now there are, certain, there are many anonymous prints, so we don't really know, but yes, there were definitely women printmakers. Um, a woman, um, 
printmaker named um, Diana Mantua. Um, there is a print by her, very large. It's a triptych. There's three that are hooked together um, on the Feast of the Gods. And uh, her father was a printmaker, and she learned from him. But she was quite well known, and it's an it's an autograph print. We know we know exactly who did it. So, um, but that's the only one that I know of in this show. Uh, but they they you know few and far between. But they did exist for sure. I mean, female artists exist in, in they existed in all media, and I mean there are women who were enamel artists with Limoges. Um, who were usually either the daughters or the spouses of, you know, it was kind of a family business. There were definitely female stained glass artists um, and, and artisans and, you know, painters a little fewer and farther between the 16th century that there are more in the 17th century, but there are a few. It's still a struggle, right? So, um, yeah, so, okay. Well, I'll acknowledge that we're over time. So thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for joining us tonight. I'll just note again that we will have this available as a recording um, after our webinar ends tonight. So if you'd like to watch again or share with a friend, please do. Um, and you can keep your eyes peeled. It will be shared in our e-blasts that we send out weekly. Um, so thank you again for joining us tonight. Thank you, Nancy, again for presenting and happy holidays, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Bye.